I've given this presentation two or three times, and I never, I hate this presentation. <laughs> I hate it. This is a glass half full, no, half empty presentation. But I'm going to give you a key today to help you get past the anxiety of all this. So as you're going through it, if you're a new beekeeper and you're saying, wow, this is just craziness, I'm going to run from beekeeping. Hang with me and we'll help you out, okay? So good morning, my name is Kevin England. If you did see my name on the slide, I'm the first VP of uh, Northwest. I want to welcome our members and those who came from wherever you came. How many are from other organizations? Raise your hand for me. One, okay. When, thank you. Uh, we're gonna go through two things today. We, we have some Northwest business, but I'm gonna keep it extremely brief and stay on task today. Uh, I do expect Tim Schuler to be here today. He's coming out for a couple things for us. So at some point he'll be along. I'm gonna roll through uh, parasites, disease, viruses, oh my, and then we'll get to explaining the new normal for you and help you get past some of this. Well, let's go, ready? Woo. All right, I'm gonna start from a funny aspect of not normal, all right? And I'll explain why in a minute. Varroa mites. When you have varroa, what's not normal in your hive is to have deformed wings. As varroa, they give your bees viruses, and we'll go over the viruses in a bit. There's a number of things that can happen when the varroa starts sucking on your bees. You get hairy, greasy bees. They're crawling from the hive. They're, they're altruistic. They're not going to die in the hive and have pestilence and famine inside your colony. They're going to leave. You're going to see them exiting when they're affected by varroa. Wait, one more housekeeping thing. I'll make this presentation available so you don't have to take notes. It'll be posted on our website. And we will also have a resource page for this stuff. And I'm going to give you the guide of guides for all of this. Before we leave, I'll give you a link to that, right? So you don't have to wear your fingers to a note, uh, writing notes. We'll get to Varroa specifically because it's such a big thing a little bit later in the program. So just hang on to that for a bit. What's not normal is trachea mites and the things that you see with that. Now, mite is a funny thing. If you think about the way the bee works, it has a spiracle, which is a little hole in the side of its body. And when bees are big enough, the trachea mite can crawl inside there and it has to be, and the bee has problems with it. For you as a beekeeper, you're clueless. Unless you have a microscope and a way to do it that way, you can't tell. So don't fret over it. If there's varroa mite, you can tell. If there's tracheal mites, you really can't. So some of these things I'm gonna show you today, they're nice for you to know. But unless you're a scientist working in a lab and have microscopes and can do all this stuff, it's just not going to be very helpful to you. You know, what, what you see with tracheomites, and it's not generally a big problem anymore, is that they die later in the year or over winter because they succumb to the pestilence of it. You can pull the head off the bee if you're so inclined and look at the thorax but how many of you think you could dissect a bee and understand what you're looking at? I, I wouldn't try it. I just don't see any use in this. Uh, when you have it, the tubes will be blotchy though, if you're interested in knowing. You'll pull it off, you'll look at the tracheal tubes. The tubes run through the bee. They're the passageway that when the bee is moving its abdomen, it's sucking. It's like a smoker, right? When you squeeze the smoker, it's sucking air through the ports. Same thing happens with a bee. It has holes in its side called spiracles. And if you see a bee on the landing board that just came back and it's pumping its abdomen real crazy, it's sucking the air in and out of its spiracles to air itself up. And if you pull the bee apart and dissect it and look at it, you can actually find those tubes and that's what this is talking about. Highly ambitious for hobby beekeepers. 
and commercial beekeepers alike. Even Tim would probably say this is a little bit crazy to live for. Brood problems, so American fowl brood. You don't see a lot of this in New Jersey. There was a case in Branchburg, so yes, it's not too far from our house. This is one that you really do need to understand. You need to know when you see it, and you need to make a phone call. So if you're looking for discolored, punctured, punctured sunken capping, and healthy brood is convex, which means it has a dome to it. It is not concave. I had a picture in this. I don't know what happened to it. Maybe it will show up somewhere else. You have dead or melted larvae. A beautiful larvae looks pearl white. It's luminescent. It's floating in juice. It's not dry, brown, coffee-colored, dark, <coughs> gooey mess. You start seeing that, that's not normal, okay? It has a distinct odor, one that you may or may not pick up. And when you look at it, there's other signs that could potentially tell you you have what you have to confirm it, like second markers, one of them being when they die the proboscis is stuck to the sidewall of the cell and it's dried up and you can literally see that. Again, something you're probably not going to recognize if you're anything less than a commercial beekeeper. How do you test for this? If you see a brown goopy cell and you think the larvae is dead, you take a twig, a matchstick, a toothpick, you put it in, you twirl it around, and you pull it out. If you get a rope, like snot coming out, <coughs> it's a good chance you have American fowl brood. There's other diseases of the brood that you do that and you don't get that rope. This is a signature of American fowl brood. Call the inspector. Call somebody. Don't ignore this. This is a big deal. How many have ever seen American fowl brood in their hives? Handful. Not a lot. So it's not something you see, but you should kind of mentally set your condition of, mm, that brood doesn't look normal, I need to do something about this, I'm going to make a phone call. Even if you call a strike team within Northwest, right, the people who are the leaders here and say, I got this thing going on and you describe it to us, we can be the front line if you don't want to call Tim up from Cape May County. Tim's here by the way, hi Tim, thank you. Yeah, I don't live in Cape May County. Either. Month? I don't remember which one. No, way far. Atlantic. Atlantic <laughs> County. One of those ocean ones down there. <laughs> there is a video about how to remediate American fowl brood. Tim made last year. We put up, it's on our Northwest channel, which we'll talk about on YouTube. European fowl brood, different but the same. It's different in the context that it's killing the larvae before it gets capped. The larvae is dead in its seat shape, sitting in the bottom of the cell. You'll start seeing spotty pattern of brood. Everybody knows when you see a nice carpet of brood that broods all the way straight across, you're in good way. When you start seeing holes throughout, there's a number of things that could cause that, and some of them are brood disease. So it doesn't always mean spotty patterns of brood disease. It's just a marker for you to go, hmm, something's not normal here. Do I have brood disease going on? Carry the theme, right? It doesn't kill, it doesn't kill colonies, but if you get a heavy dose of American or European fowl brood, you can take a good hit on this. Non-uniform color change of the larvae. So when it's American fowl brood, it turns one color brown, the whole thing. This one is non-uniform. If you could see, maybe the picture's not too bad here. Um, they're a little mottled looking. They change from pearly white to yellowish to brown. And finally go grayish, which is not American fowl brood. They don't turn gray. Okay, but blotchy is what you're looking for. Blotchy is a more indicator of European fabric. They don't look as plump. 
if you you should have at this point I'm hoping does anybody not have a hive at home everybody's had one. everybody's been in your hive and you've seen larvae in the bottom in the CC they're plump they're juicy if, if you like to eat bugs you could probably just pop one in they look <laughs> morsel like right they're not dry withered out as you see can you demonstrate I would you got one <laughs> It tastes like scrambled egg. Okay. Okay. See? People do eat this stuff. It tastes like scrambled egg. Yeah, there you go. So use, use teramycin to get rid of this. If you have European foul brood, you're going to sprinkle teramycin. What I would suggest to you is if you want to know how to remediate this, you can go also watch that other video that Tim had because he showed how he dosed out teramycin, right? There's an American foul brood video, it's labeled that, with state apiarists in our YouTube channel that has an idea of how you do this treatment. Varroa, you're going to see irregular patterns because bees are dying. If they're hygienic, they're pulling them out and they're making holes in the brood pattern. You're going to see spotty brood pattern and dead brood found in the cells. Yellow, brown, dark brood. If you have one of these that, you know, if a bee dies because it's been sucked to its death out of a hive and you put a toothpick in it, it's not going to rope. I don't, I, I've seen really big infested Varroa hives. I don't know that I always see a lot of dead larvae in the thing, so this is kind of a weird indicator, but it is possible. Chalk brood, they resemble pieces of chalk, literally. They're mummified. They become hard. And the bees will take these out and remove them and put them at the entrance of the hive. They'll literally pull them out. Usually, the bees can handle this. And you see it on the outskirts of the hive where the drone is. Most of the times when you're looking at a 10 frame box, one, two, three is where they put their drone. You'll find it in that area. I have a picture of it. It looks like that. So strong colonies, they get discarded by worker bees and they go about their business. Not something you generally have to worry about. You want to improve your ventilation to solve this problem. Okay. Sack brood, it's scattered among the healthy brood kind of a weird thing to see. It's, it occurs after the cell is sealed. And it's something that you see a puncture. So if you're ever looking at a full frame and you see a puncture in the frame, what happens with the genes of the bees is they recognize something's wrong inside that cell. And one set of bees will come by and puncture the hole in the capping. That's all they do. They don't go in and take it out. The next set of bees, their job is to find that puncture and come in and remove the brood. That's no good, okay? That's what it looks like, sac brood. The larvae's hard, you could pluck it out. It's got a black head, not very attractive. I don't think I'd eat that one, Stan. No. <laughs> First half of the brood rearing season usually goes unnoticed by us, it just happens occasionally. They take care of it themselves. If you're having a problem, then chances are there might be something wrong with your queen. Okay. And there is a point there that says you want to consider hygienic stock. That clean out the cell of bad things, no matter what it is, hygienic stock takes care of that. You keep hearing like, hygienic queens, hygienic queens. That's what they're talking about. If you have a hygienic queen that has traits in her bloodline that will go in and clean these things out for you, they'll sense Varroa and they'll open the cell and take the larvae out. They'll sense the stuff and take care of it. When you hear people saying, I sell hygienic queens, they've tested them for certain things and found that this queen is more hygienic than the other queen and the way that they take care of their brood. 
I, I'm purposely not going down in the weeds with these things because I don't want you to fret over them and I don't want you to all leave here <laughs> that way, okay? <clears throat> Nozema, there's two kinds, Nozema apis and Nozema serrani. The symptoms are nonspecific. Again, you need a microscope for this. There are ways to tell, but generally people have Nozema. It's in all the hives and you don't even know it. How big and how infested your hive is, is a different thing, but again, you can't treat for Nozema serrani. <laughs> you can treat for Nozema amus by using apis by using fumido, but it doesn't work for the other one. Most people have serrani in their hives. The other thing about fumido or fumagellin, sometimes you hear it called, it's extremely hard on the bees. So prophylactically, some people put this in their hives. Some people will tell you that's not a great idea because it's wrecking the fauna inside the bee gut. It's very harsh on the bees, okay? It's like giving your kids medicine when they don't really need it. So you really can't detect this. Sometimes people claim that dysentery, you'll see bee poop on the outside of your hive, is caused by nosema. There's a lot of debate about that. Dysentery could be from your late in the season, you fed the bees a lot of sugar solution and they haven't had a chance to ripen it and they're eating that and that causes dysentery. That's not nosema. So a lot of people immediately jump to the conclusion that if they have dysentery all over their hives, they have nosema. The two don't always add up, right? So be careful about that thing you hear out in the world. Viruses, there's 11 of them. I could go through the detail on them. The form wing is probably the one you're going to see a lot. You see these bees with shriveled up. You may possibly see some of these other ones in here. Really, the gist of this is to fix the virus is to get rid of the varroa, which is vectoring the virus. So don't worry about the virus, worry about the varroa. That's why I don't dive into these. If you want to know more, I'm going to give you a resource. I'm going to roll my, sorry. Then you have your pests. Hive beetles, which we covered in detail. There's a resource page on our website about that. Anybody having hive beetle problems this year? One. Anybody else? Only if the hives are small. No, I don't have a problem with it. I just saw one the other day, so it means they're back. They're here. They're back. I shot a video last week. If you go look at one of the latest videos on the YouTube, you'll see I pulled the bottom board out and all the hive beetle lover were crawling. They're there. Get your hives in the sun. And this generally won't be a problem for you. Get them in the sun. Do not have them in the shade. If you put them in the shade, you're, you're playing roulette here. High beetles are working their way north. They generally don't do well in our climate, but if you think about it, they're there. They're like a wax moth. They're, they're meant to clean up after nature. You have a rotten watermelon, they come in and eat that stuff. But the vector of the smells inside the hive closely emulate rotting fruit and they found a new home. And high beetles are moving north. People didn't think they could survive in our climate. The fact of the matter is, yes, they can. Um, there's a good presentation by Mike Embry from the University of Delaware on this, and he's literally tracking them coming north. And he's in the Maryland region on the eastern shore, and they have them big time there. So we will probably do more in the lexicon of beekeeping in New Jersey as this continues to move north, if that's what's going to happen. The jury's out on that. It is highly likely that you have bears in your area if you're in Hunter and Warren County. And if you're watching the forums or keeping track of what's going on, they are hitting your hives. It's not pestilence or disease, but it does the same thing. It destroys your hive. Put your bear fences up. Follow the proper direction from the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. There was a great presentation by Michelle Smith from New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife in February at the NJBA meeting. It's the whole thing graciously has been posted on our YouTube, you can watch it. It really gives you everything you need to know about the insights of the migratory patterns, how to set your bear fence up and all the particulars. 
about making sure that you bait it properly and things like that. Great first primer. Wax moths, you should not have problems with your wax moths unless you're doing something. Wax moths are after brood comb, and they should only be able to get to it if your hive is not strong enough to defend it. They're not generally after honeycomb unless you've had brood in, in the past. You do, however, have to take care of the stuff you have in your garage that doesn't have bees in it yet, or in your shed, or in your honey house, or whatever that is. Where are you going to end up with that? You. 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 Yeah. This was a frame that we put in plastic and opened it up in the spring, and this is what it looked like. Up in the corner, you see what the wax moth looks like. They're little larvae. They'll eat your woodenware. They do, they do a lot of damage. They're great. They're nature's cleanup. You know, if a hive dies in nature instead of pestilence, they go and they clean it up for us. So you should not, if you keep and maintain strong colonies, wax moths should not be an issue for you. So other things that are not normal. Drones and worker cells. In the middle of a brood pattern, you see a bullet cap. That's a drone. Something's kind of funny there. That's not normal. Egg layers. There should be one egg standing on end, eventually lays down, grows to a seed. If you look in the cell with the sun to your back and you see three or four eggs in the bottom, that's not normal. Something's wrong there. Okay, you have an egg layer. Dysentery is what we talked about. Give them ventilation. Don't feed so late. Make sure they can cap it off before the first frost. Pesticide kill, you're going to see a lot of stuff at the front of the hive, possibly. That's, that's not overly common, quite frankly. There's all this word about CCD and, you know, the pesticides and all that, but generally you don't get into that. If you are somebody that moves your bees into orchards and things like that, you're more likely to encounter those. But if you're at home and you've been through a couple seasons, chances are you're not going to run into pesticide kill. That doesn't mean it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a dialogue with some of your neighbors, if they're, especially if they're farmers. I have a farmer literally six feet from the front of my hives. He comes in next on the door and lets me know that he's going to spray Roundup next day, things like that, right? So don't be afraid to have a dialogue with these folks. You generally shouldn't run into problems. Uh, I do have one hive that's struggling and The, the general indication is that the queen's not doing the right thing. Something wrong with your queen. If she's not vigorous and laying full patterns, and you're starting to see bullet, then either she's old or she didn't get mated properly. Yeah, I mean, it was the, the, the recently installed canister, the queen was DOA, it was so it was just she's coming to speed, or? He, you know, some of those, there's no absolutes. Sometimes the queen is new. And she needs to practice a little bit. I mean, I don't, the, the key that you said to me is she's a new queen. She, she might have to get her act together and how she's going to lay and stuff like that. But watch the hive. And if you don't see good patterns, you're going to consider making a change because that's not normal, right? Obviously, you, you have not normal when you have bees head in after you come out of winter and they're dead. That's starvation. That's you didn't feed them enough or they didn't have enough stores or the cluster was too small that they couldn't get out and get to the stores that were right next to them. That's not normal. Okay. And if something's going on, I had one hive, the queen went out, had plenty of stores, and I'm looking at the hive and there's all this activity going on. And the clue for me was that there were cappings at the entrance. Why are there honey cappings at the entrance? That's a robbing indicator. That's not normal. That means nobody's at home to defend the stores and somebody's making away with everything that they had in there. So just because you see bees flying in and out of the entrance doesn't mean that hive's in good shape. A lot of people are very, very intimidated or hands off and don't use their hives. They don't go in them and look what's going on. And they think that this hive is fully operational and then they open it up someday and find out the thing is shot. If you're taking frames out and the frames are torn, 
meaning the edges are all frayed, you're getting robbed. That's what they're doing. If you have a small cluster and they can't defend the hive, close the entrance down. Take care of that. That's not normal when you're seeing cappings all over the front of the entrance. So are you ready to give up yet? <laughs> I always love this presentation because you think about there's 10,000 things you could go wrong and people go screaming. So let's talk the way it should be. So we're going to start with the end in mind. And I'm going to give you some great advice right at the end of this. A normal hive requires a healthy population of bees, an appropriate mix of stores and pollen and honey in a configuration that is something you should get attuned to and accustomed to. And your job is to recognize what normal is. That's your job, and it's not a hard job. I'm going to tell you how. First thing is eggs turn into larvae. You've seen the pictures, you know what they look like. The queen lays one egg in the bottom of the cell. It's sitting in a pool of royal jelly. If it's a dirt that's a little bit dry, that's not great, but it's not something you could do. And that egg should grow to a C-shaped larvae. And then eventually it will stand up. And on the fifth or sixth day, it gets capped. And it'll grow to the point where it comes out. If you go in your hives, even just once a week, you're gonna see that. You're gonna see the progression of your brood. Your brood, all your brood is your, everybody loves a queen, but the brood is what is the gold inside your hive, the brood and the comb. It's a promissory note that your hive is gonna survive. So you wanna make sure that you have good brood patterns. Healthy larvae are pearly white and they glisten. They look like that. Ooh, ah, that's what you should be doing. Nice, beautiful, sea safe plump. And they taste like scrambled eggs out here. <laughs> <laughs> Caps brood. There's my convex picture. It should be medium brown, convex, no punctures, solid pattern. A typical brood frame looks like this. The center has brood. Nice, beautiful pattern. Right around the edge, it has pollen because they need the pollen to feed the larvae. Along the outside edge of that, they still need <coughs> nectar, so you usually see it up in the corners. That's a beautiful brood frame. Frame after frame after frame, that's what you want to see in your hive. <coughs> pollen is steak, nectar is carb. That's what they need. Can't live without it. They need one other resource, actually two. Water, and they need propolis. Have to have it. Propolis is the immunity inside the hive. It's part of the ecosystem. You're in there scraping all the propolis out, you're possibly taking the immunity out, right? Some people don't like it. I don't like it on the shoulders because it starts to spread the things out, so I scrape it off, but a lot of times I try to be judicious about not scraping all that out. They worked really hard to get that. There's what a nice frame looks like. Here's my pattern. You see this strip right here? That strip has open nectar and it has pollen in it and what's up in the corners? Cap honey for them. That's normal. You need to know what normal is. It should look like that. Healthy adults. They emerge. They go through their four systems, four casts. First thing they do is they get out. They have to harden for a day. Then they get to jobs like cleaning the cells, maybe their own cell. They graduate to a bee that feeds and does housekeeping. Eventually they transition into, you know, the, the first bees live 24 hours and work in the hive. They're the workforce. There's some 16 jobs that they do in that first two casts. Eventually, they'll turn into a worker bee, um, I'm missing the term for it, 
what's referred to as a, an adult bee. Forager bee? Forager. Not a forager, the step before a forager. That's a nurse bee? Guard. No, I, I miss it. A middle aged bee, a man. Oh, you got it. Middle aged. <laughs> okay. So, a middle aged bee is the one that does the myriad of jobs inside the hive. They build wax, they do uh, clean up, they perform the activities of, you know, drying the honey, blowing bubbles, popping it back, things like that, right? They get to the point where they turn into a forger and they go off. You should see a mix of jobs going on inside when you're looking at your hive and a clear mix of beautiful bees inside the hive. The girls are gorgeous. They're shiny. You've seen a new bee, especially in the spring when they come out. You look at them, man, that's a Cadillac bee. That thing <laughs> looks great, right? They don't look scrubbed. They don't look deformed wing. Now, you, you are going to see foragers and they look rough. Their wings are tattered. All the hair is rubbed off. They've earned that look, right? So you are going to see some of them in there. But generally, your bees should look healthy. You know what people don't do when they inspect their hives? They don't look at the bees. Look at your bees. I'm serious. You're going to go, wow. That's why you take these pictures like this and you say, I, I take these pictures as I'm rolling through my hives, and then I go back and I spend time opening my pictures and just, I look at every bee. What does it look like? They look great, look at them. You're looking for capped honey or uncapped honey. Uncapped honey looks like black gold. It's, it looks like a hard pearl inside the shell. It's not all the way to the top usually. If you hold it up in the sun, it looks very glassy looking. And then it gets capped in a pearly white cap. Eventually they'll walk on it and it'll get dirty. But it should look good. They take good care of it. It should look nice to you. Wrong way. Looks like that. That's not a show frame yet, but it's pretty close. Not too bad, right? At the end of the season, when you get to that first frost, it should look like that. You should not be feeding and feeding and feeding to the point where you totally choke the hive, that they have no room to operate, and they can't ripen it, and you got all this moisture going on. Moisture is the evil of a hive, evil. You want them to be able to control their moisture. Don't keep loading them up. Be bread, simple stuff. They take the bee, they compact it to a little they take the pollen, they compact it into a little pellet, they cover it over, ferment it a little bit, and it'll last for seasons actually for them if they want to. And it looks like that. Beautiful. Got to have it. Can't raise brood without it. So it, it's not normal not to have pollen in the hive. Have to have it in order to raise bees and sustain. Queen cells, it is normal. It is normal, especially this time of season. They'll build them, they'll tear them down, they'll move them around, they practice. It doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have a swarm, but if you do see one capped, you're heading that direction. This is the time where if your hive is completely bound and you have not given them room and your brood chamber is crowded, and your honeycomb is crowded, and there's unemployed bees because there's just no more room to put anything, you're gonna start seeing cap swells. And it takes eight days for them to cap that queen, and 16 for that queen to launch, and between eight and 16, your swarm is gonna go. When you see cap cells, you're gonna have a swarm. Don't go around and pinch them all off, because you could kill your queen that's going to be and then you'll be queenless. Figure out some other manner. Take that queen cell out, do an artificial split before they go or let them swarm or whatever you're gonna do, right? But queen cells are a normal part of the ecosystem. Nothing to get too concerned about here. They look like that if you've never seen one. Literally Mr. Peanut hanging off the bottom of the frame. Not normal to see them out of the middle of the frame. They hang down, not out down. If you see them in the middle of the frame, 
pointing this way, supersede your emergency cells. Something's wrong with your queen and they doing something in a quick, fast, in a hurry, okay? That frame is laying this way, but if I stood it up, that'd be pointing down and you typically find them down along the bottom edges. You could do a very quick check, usually pop the box and roll it up and look at the bottom of the frames and you'll be able to see whether you have queen cells or not. When you have one that's merged recently, I don't know how well it shows up here. See how chewed that is? Something chewed. So usually when a queen is ready to go, imminent, they'll come and they'll chew a little bit for her so she's easier for her to come out and then she chews herself out, out of the cell. And you'll see it in tatters. That's a recently emerged queen. Okay. Your homework assignment is to go home on this holiday weekend and look in your hive and know what normal is. That's your job. <clears throat> because chances are, as I look across this room, there's maybe one person in here that has disease, pestilence, something going on, but the rest of you are in normal. So go look at your hives. That's your job. Use your eyes. If you see something that's not normal, you could feel free to Facebook anybody. If you, I, I don't know why our Northwest page hasn't taken off, but I see Northeast, I see uh, Central Jersey, they have Facebook pages, and all the new beekeepers are on there asking questions. And generally, from my experience, when I watch what people are saying, they almost always get the right answer in a roundabout way. Sometimes somebody will say something and they'll be you know, correct it gently or whatever, but they almost always, you have a very vast knowledge. So go home and look in your hives, look at each of the frames, understand what normal is. The brood, now, this is a funny thing. If my sun is over there, sunshine, and my hive is facing this way for some reason because it's late in the afternoon. Anybody ever <coughs> see the movie, The Replacements? Football movie? The guy gets sick and they're in the huddle and they all have to move and everybody goes like this. <laughs> everybody know that scene? If you do, you know what I'm talking about. When the sun is in the afternoon and it's beating on this side of the hive, sometimes the bees move over to that side of the hive. Or sometimes in the morning they'll move over here. They do move around if you look at the studies that they have on the internet that talk about this type of stuff. But generally you find the brood in the middle. Right outside the brood you find the pollen. Outside that, you might find some drone, and you usually find honey on the outside. That's normal. Go and look how your hive's operating today. Figure out what's normal. One thing that people do sometimes is they take their hives apart and they put them back in the wrong order. The bees had them a certain way, they want them that way. <coughs> put them back the way you found them. But you should understand, brood in the middle, usually there's pollen on the outside of them, and then, as I said, the order of precedence. So know what normal is. If you start seeing funny things about the way your hive is constructed inside, just kind of mental note something's going on here. And if you have questions, you're looking at something and it's not normal, feel free to ask on Facebook or, you know, your network. We have a Yahoo group available to us. When you don't see what's normal, figure out what's going on. I provided this resource courtesy of Tim, Honeybee Guide and their maladies, right, from Penn State. It's outstanding. All the detail and minutia you ever want to know. You're that person who wants to know everything there is about parasitic mite syndrome. That thing will give you a good start on it. Okay? Yes? That's on the Merrick website? It's on Penn State. I found it on Merrick. I, I think yeah. it's people okay. have pilfered it and copied it around. There's a link on our homepage to this. Yes. That's the newest edition, correct? Can yeah, the one that you sent me, yeah. and I got the link from Penn yeah. State. Literally, I linked to Penn State one, so I made sure we get the right one. Perfect. If you're unsure, and you've you've taken a, you know, I see something funny. I see brown brood. What does it mean? Oh, he said it could be this or it could be that. I've gone. I've looked in the guide. I still am not sure. Pick up the phone. Give a call. Call one of us, send an email, 
you can contact uh, the state apiarist office and they'll come out and look. We're starting a program here in Northwest called the Strike Team. We're going to go with Tim later today and a couple people are going to go through some more hands-on detail stuff with the expectation that if you have something we'll come out and see you and we'll confirm what you're looking at if you're not sure and if it requires um, intervention we will call in the, the forces on that okay if you have enough wherewithal to understand you have American foul bread, call the apiarist. <laughs> call them. I want to, why don't I introduce you, Tim, because I don't know that everybody knows you. This is Tim Schuler. He's the New Jersey State well, apiarist. You want to introduce yourself and your yeah, team? I'm Tim Schuler. I'm not the enemy. I'm your friend. I want a healthy beekeeping industry in New Jersey. There are so many beekeepers, there is no way that I can get around and inspect all the hives in this state. That's why you are the first line of defense for a healthy beekeeping industry, each and every one of you. And I commend the Northwest Branch for putting on a training like this and starting to develop this program a little bit up here. Um, you know what, when you guys know what normal is, that's the key. Anything that's not normal, let's try to figure out what, what, what's going on so we don't have a problem that becomes bigger than it ought to be. Uh, that's all I'm about. All right, thank you. Thanks. Part of what you do every time you go in the hive affects the way the general apiary works. You need to be checking your mites and you need to follow good inspection protocol. Some of us in the room have multiple sites. If you're going out to multiple sites, don't contaminate one from the other by using leather gloves. How many people use gloves in the room? It's okay, a lot. How many are using just nitrile gloves versus canvas? How many go barehanded? Okay, so I see a reasonable mix across the audience here. I'd have to say it's 30, 30, 20, and who knows what the rest answer. <laughs> if you're using cotton gloves, canvas gloves, things like that, they don't get rid of stuff. Some people don't like nitrile gloves. They don't like the feel or they don't like the ecology part because you're throwing them away every time you use them. It's, it's really personal preference. A lot of people also go barehanded. The, the new beekeepers understandably almost always start with some sort of gloves. I'll get to you in one sec. And it's not a bad idea, but you are missing that tactile feel. And it's easy to crush a bee and then set off the alarm pheromone. Nitrile gloves are a good balance between that, and for whatever reason, I find that bees don't particularly like that substance. They don't walk on it. They don't, and they, they're theoretically not supposed to be able to sting through it. But I have big paws, so every time I use them, I break them with it. Like rip, they're done. That's that's it. I've gone, I, and I work in the computer industry. I type all day. To get stung on the fingers is the worst travesty mm -hmm. in the world for me. But I have learned to take my time and graduate from one to the other to now I am almost always, um, you know, barehanded. Just if the, the key to using your gloves, whatever choice you use, is keep them clean, throw them in a washer. Don't infect your other hives by, you know, if you got a problem with one, don't use them in the other. And um, take your time if you're using bigger gloves. Always take your time so you're not crushing bees and creating more strife for yourself. The guidance is go to the bottom of the colony and inspect your way up. It's personal preference, but that's a good guidance. You'll take your inner cover off, you'll take your upper cover, or your upper box and put it down. Put your inner cover over it and start on the bottom. One of the theories about that is you're working in the bottom hive. You just disturb them like crazy. They may not particularly be happy with you. You take the next box and you put it back on top and all is right in the world. You do it the other way around you're really tearing the hive up, right? Starting the bottom box. But if your objective is, is the hive operational and you look in, you know, you look in and you see brood and you go through the top box and you see larvae and so on, don't tear the whole box apart. You've, you've met your objective. 
if I can get to the fourth frame in and pick it up and I got larvae and eggs and whatever and I know the queen is right and there's plenty of bees and everything is good, maybe you don't go in the bottom box. So always measure your inspection with whatever your objective is when you're going in. Always use the outside frame. Okay. Let's have a, a show of hands. Yeah, Tim. Can I just add to that? Yep. Uh, once the honey supers go on, generally don't go in the brood chamber mm -hmm. unless they're not working in the honey supers. If they're not working in the honey supers and I put honey supers on, I expect them to be in there. If they're not in there two weeks later, I need to go in the brood chamber and find out what the heck's going on. If they're up there and there's white comb and they're storing honey, I don't need to go in the brood chamber. I've already done my brood chamber inspection. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, good point. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't come back to your question. Go ahead. What the night? I'm not familiar with the nitron gloves. Um, a blue glove. Nitron gloves are the, a lot of people use uh, plastic gloves or the, the ones that you'd use in a hospital. They were, they were used to be made out of latex. A lot of people have latex allergies, so they've switched to nitron, which is a different substrate, but very much just like a latex glove. Just like, yeah. Have you? Uh, Home Depot. Home Depot. You could, you could get them, yeah, you'll pay less at Home Depot versus going to. Uh, ShopRite sells them. Oh, really? I think so, yeah. I think Costco does. Costco. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty wild. You know, some people, they rip what I tell you. They use dish gloves. Uh, Same idea. Right? Go to ShopRite and buy yourself some, some dishwashing gloves. Get three pair for $6. Three pair for $6. And you can wash your hands in between. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because they make night product gloves. They're not exam gloves. They're actually for mechanics. Yeah. And they're heavier weight and they'll wash them. Yep. They're thinner than the washing gloves by a good margin. I, I see gloves that run the gamut. One of the things that I, I use sometimes when I don't want propolis all over my hands and I know I'm giving a really important presentation the next day, I use mechanic gloves. Mechanics wear. They're really comfortable. They're made for dexterity. Bees will sting through them, but if you're careful, you know. Um, go in the outside frame, there's usually less activity there. How many people run 10 frames in their hive versus 9? How many run 9? Yeah. So you might find on a, on a, think about a frame, what it looks like. The frames come together in the hive and they rest on those shoulders where they touch. Usually you take your hive tool and the first thing you do is go down between the shoulders to separate them. You pry it open, you pop it up. Bees love to build propolis on that shoulder. And eventually what happens is the shoulder that should touch gets wider and wider and wider. And the next one's the same. And then you have everything totally wedged inside where you go get that first frame and you need a truck to pull it out of there. Clean the shoulders off, tighten everything up if you're running 10 frames, and start with the outside frame. Some people recommend that you start actually with the second one. Because when you pull that first one up, you have the bees against bees, generally not a bad idea as you're pulling it up, but you have bees against hardwood and sometimes you roll the bees and crush one. I've seen recommendations that you go to the second one because when you pull that frame out and you're making space, bees against bees, they get out of their own way. Would encourage you to consider one of those frame hangers so you're not throwing your frame on the ground and kicking it, and things like that, okay? But go after the, the outside one. Never, ever, ever is a fundamental tenet that the queen can't be there. Barbara said yesterday she took off the top cover and there was the queen. The queen is everywhere and she's nowhere all at the same time. Sometimes you can't find her and other times she's right there. Always, always, always work over your hive. Make sure your queen's not there before you're taking your stuff away. Okay? And chances are she's in with the brood and if it's in the middle where we said it would be, you're usually safe pulling out that first frame and not crushing your queen. But just always keep that in the back of your mind. Anything I miss on this? But this is a good inspection procedures per Tim. He was happy to share this with me. And I like the last one, Tim, which is what I said before. Be gentle, take your time. You know, if you watch the one video that we just put up recently, my father always used to say to me, state your business and get off the phone when I was a kid. <laughs> know what you're going to do and get out of the hive, but be gentle.
Okay, now I get to the one part where I am going to dig down, which is manage Varroa. This isn't optional. You want to find out why everybody's hives die in New Jersey? Either they didn't get fed properly and weren't taken care of, or you didn't manage your Varroa. That's a blanket condemnation, but it's absolutely true. Yeah. They will eventually kill your colony. No doubt about it. So you need your management plan now. You need to figure out how you're going to test for them, how you're going to monitor, and how you're going to treat. You need to have your supplies in hand, and you need to track your records on this stuff. Not optional. Sorry. You're going to be a beekeeper in New Jersey. You've got to do this. You're going to sample between July and September. Randy Oliver was here last year about this time, and he said he samples all year long. He's in Grass, Cali, Grass Valley, California. Very nice there. Not always nice here. So if right now you're not going to see huge infestations. If you're looking at your bottom covers, if you have them or whatever, not seeing a ton of mites. That's not to say that when the bees ramp in spring, the mites can't go with them because they're in the hive all the time. But generally, right now, not a big problem. July, August, when it goes the other way. Now, why? Fall, go through winter, come out in spring, huge forage, lots of nectar, pollen available for them. June comes, and it starts on the downward spiral. The mites are growing with the bees. Doesn't that make sense? The drones are coming out in the spring, the mites are populating, you've got huge drone populations, mites, 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 mites. Queen gets to June, forage dries up, queen starts shutting down, but the mites are just hitting their peak. And they overwhelm in July and August. That's just a little food for thought for you, right? So July and August, start monitoring your mites. When you start to see that ramp down, know that it's coming. And you need to take care of your bees. Your objective every year, if you want honey or you want your bees to survive, is to make your bees overwinter. That's, that's how things happen in the spring. So if your bees are going to overwinter, the way they overwinter is they need several crops of non-parasitized bees going into winter. That first frost comes, there better have been three brood cycles full brood cycles to build the workforce you need to keep all those things warm, keep the colony warm over winter, and they can't be sick, can't be sick. If everybody's sick, the hive dies in the spring and you say, what happened? Because you didn't take care of your mites in July and August. This is not complicated, that's the funny thing about it. It's not. Do your mite counts, treat for your mites in July and August, September, Get three good colonies before you go into fall and over winter with them and you will be rewarded in the spring. They'll be in the cell or they'll be on the bee. If you're waiting to see a bee with Varroa mite on them, you are too late. <laughs> you see mites on the bees, you're toast. Hive is dead and they don't know it. You're going to look in the drone brood. When you open that frame that I said before and you're looking for queen cells, you're also looking for bridge comb. A lot of times you'll see them building drone brood in there. Scrape one off, crack the thing open, and see if it looks like that. If it looks like that, you've got issues. That's where you can check. Break those cells open. Drone brood is a favorite. Why? They incubate longer. You can get three runs of mites in a drone brood versus a worker cell because they have a longer gestation period. And you're going to find the mites in the drone brood. 80% of it, according to Dr. Musson from California, 80% of all the mites are inside the drone brood or higher. I've heard 90%. How do you do it? You sample your drone brood through your burr comb. That's the stuff that they build in between. How many of you open your hives and you're seeing those, you know, Oh God, there's larva broken open underneath this. That's what you're seeing. That's where you're looking for your mites. They crack open, you don't even have to break the cell open. You can just look. You'll see mites. Do a sugar roll or do an ether roll. Those are usually the dependable method. If you're using a bottom board, um, one of those sample boards, 
I, I always have this problem with it. I have one hive that's going okay. It's got about 40,000 bees. And I got another hive over here that's got 80,000 bees. The thing is bursting. And I'm doing mite counts with the same threshold. Does that make any sense? Not to me, it doesn't. If you're going to use the sticky board method, take it out. Did it have a lot more mites than the last time I looked at it? I think I better do something about it. But my recommendation is you do a sugar roll or an ether roll. You also can do drone brood capping or unculling. I'll explain what that is in a second. When you do a sugar roll, you're looking for half cup of bees, shake them up, no more than six mites in that sample. Okay. I'll, get, I'll get to that uh, procedure in one second here. Make sure that the, once the sugar is added into the bees, you got to wait five or six minutes for the mites to loosen. Yep, it's got to melt. So this is what the mites look like, in case you haven't seen them. There's a video of this on our YouTube channel where this mite crawls across this, but it's really creepy. <laughs> you can take a look at it on our YouTube channel. I actually shot that out of it. This is drone brood color. You put this in your second or third frame, and they will build drone there, which is kind of neat for us. I don't know about you, I like my hives neat and tidy. And I like that they build it there. And what you do is don't brood up and then breed mites. There you go. Because if you put this thing in, and it's full all the way through and you don't pull it out, you're making a mite factory. So the gist of it is, is to understand the incubation, they build this thing out, in 21 days these will hatch. You pull it out and you take a knife and you cut all that out and you throw it away. Or you put it in the freezer or you uncap it and pull it out. It takes a long time and a lot of work for the bees to build all of that in there. So I. You know, we used to give them to our chickens and they totally destroyed it, and I stopped doing that. I would cut it off and get rid of the larvae and put it back in. The other thing about building these, that comb eventually becomes like a magnet. It has that odor to it that just absolutely draws the mites in it. So, but this is a great way to take care. And you're not, you're not doing harm by killing all your drones. They'll make more. On the YouTube video, it shows you how to do an ether roll and a sugar roll. <laughs> you, you fill the, you take the bees off of a brood frame. Brood frame has to be a brood frame. You want nurse bees. You're going to look for who on there first. Queen. You're going to take a panel and you're going to tap it and dump all the bees. You're going to take a scooper, half scoop, put it in the box, in the in the cup, shake it. You'll see the procedure. There's two cups put together with a screen in the middle. The bees are in one part. You turn it over and shake it. I mean, shake it. You want the stuff to come off. And then you turn it over and all the stuff particularly floats through and you hold it up to the sun and you count the mites. That's what they look like. You get more than six in a sample of 300, tree drops. You want to do this in the sugar way, as Tim was just discussing. You put sugar in there, powdered sugar. You shake the bees. And then you set them down. And what you have to have happen is it has to get hot enough for that sugar to melt. The sugar becomes greasy. They can't hold on. And the mites fall off. And then you shake the thing down and count the mites. What you do is you shake it over a bottle of water and all the debris folds and the mites. And you can count them right on the surface. All the stuff sinks and the mites float. That procedure's again on our on our site. You can go look at it. Resources, I'm talking about our website. We're gonna add a resource page on this stuff today. Marek, it hasn't been updated for years, I don't know why. I, I wish they would come back and refresh because there's a lot of information that's old, but the core of the information is really good. All season long, you want to know how to do spring management, summer management, fall management, they have guides. Some of it's a little out of date, but you know, common sense will tell you what to do. And the Penn site, this is posted, this thing on our homepage today. And I'm 
seven minutes over, so I'll stop and ask questions about the presentation. Anything anybody has um, about what we talked about today? On a drone frame, uh, you take it out of the freezer. What do you do with all the, the you pick them all out of the cell? No. No, so you put it in the freezer, and that will kill the larvae and the mites. And then you put it back into the hive, and they will clean those cells out to reuse them. You let it thaw out first. Yeah, you want to thaw it. You don't want to give them the popsicle, but you want to, unless it's summertime, they might enjoy it. <laughs> yes? On the drone growing fully, I found it worked best for me to have it at least three of those frames set up so that they'll build them out, put the drones in. You take one out, put it in the freezer, put another one in. Mm -hmm. Today you take that one out, put it in the freezer, put another one in. Next time you go out, take that one out, put it in the freezer, put the third one in. You got one in the freezer. If you can, you know, you set that many up. You got a couple in the freezer and you just keep rotating them back and forth. Yeah. Kenny, uh, uh, I want to ask you something. Did you know, did you have any swarms? No. Okay. Yeah, you, that, that is, so they always recommend you have at least two and three is better. And when you get to the point where you're not breeding mites because you pulled it out, you want to put the next frame in. You want to catch that crate because as you put that out, put it in the freezer, the mites are gone elsewhere. Some people actually say they leave them right in all year long. No problem with that, right? Question? Is the drone room cell larger? Is that why they lay drones in there? What's different about that? It is, it is larger, um, physically larger, and they incubate for 21 days. I mean, why would they just lay in that frame? What, what made that frame so special that they only lay drones? They choose, they choose both worker and drone but they prefer drone because no, no, it's bigger because it's bigger and yeah yeah let me go back makes it a drone frame. I'm sorry so when you start with this thing there's no foundation in it this is this is a square frame with a bar across usually they don't put this one they have uh, drone in the top. Usually what they do is they put comb in the top and they put honey in the top. Almost everyone that I've seen, this one's an anomaly. And then they build comb from scratch. You don't put foundation because if you put foundation in, it might build worker cells, not. But if you leave them that space in the third one out, for whatever reason they like that, they'll build drone. All drone, that's all drone. So, no, I just wonder why, why they choose to make drone in that. I, I don't, just whoever figured this out was genius as to why that bar makes a difference. I don't know. The, you know, typically what you find, the biology of the bee is they're going to build worker comb in the top. If you go to a natural comb, cut out a bee tree or something like that, you're going to find worker, and on the periphery they always build drone. So this kind of emulates the bottom of the frame. That's the theory behind it. By putting that bar and it's below what would be normally, they build drone in there. Somebody figured that out. It's a smarter space, than me. Space issue. It's just I like find that early in the season they do drone in a kind of like frame. But later in the season they don't need drones. They, they seem to understand that they just don't do drone. Yeah, the, the hive ecosystem always evolves uh, in the springtime. You know, you start seeing the drone come out when the queen wants to get mated, and they're building drone comb if you give them the opportunity. There's always a certain percentage of your space dedicated to drone, no matter what. They may not be building drones, but it's in there. Stan? Could you put a uh, drone foundation cell in there, too? Yeah. You could. Yeah. You could buy foundation for small cell, regular cell, drone. Small cell or drone cell. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to know when you actually put the drone frame in. Usually the first time you do your inspection and you have the opportunity to open the hive, first 60 degree day. If you don't have them in there already, it's not a bad time. I have a brand new hive though. Springtime. You could put them in now. Yeah. If you, did you buy a package or a nuke? 
Package. Package. So as they build out six, seven, eight, nine, if you have seven, if you have one of these, they'll build drone in that. So I should start that now. You, you can now, yeah, you can. I, I'm, I'm going to make a generalization and, and I hope nobody cringes. Usually first year packages don't have a lot of mic problems for whatever reason. It's year two when you're in trouble. But they also say year one packages don't make honey and they don't do this. There's no absolutes. But my, my experience, for what it's worth, is generally you don't see a ton of mic problems in a first year package. But that's well, not to say. You won't know if you don't look, will you? You won't know. So you need to understand what normal is. <laughs> Any other questions? I got one. Yeah. About drone calling, uh, this is for the floor, if anybody knows. Uh, if anybody systematically drone calls, do they have any trouble keeping their queens fertile or with um, supersedence and, and then running into not having um, the good luck of nature? You know, like you have a new queen, she needs to go get mated, and there's no drone around for some reason. Not I've, yet. I've never. Not yet. I, I know. There's always enough drones in a congregating area. Yeah, there's I, always there. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not a good test because uh, Schaefer has two dozen hives a mile from me. I, I mean, if I'm not making drones, he is. My Cardonians are mixing with his Italian girls and boys. Yeah. So, are you advocating doing this in addition to chemical treatment, or are you advocating this as part of an integrated pest management regimen instead of chemical I'm treatment? I'm advocating this as an integrated pest management. I mean, some people just don't want to put chemicals in their hives. Okay. I don't know that I'm that soft about it. I use Apigard. I will use Mind Away Quick Strips. I don't have problems with those things. But if you want to try and keep your stuff down, you know, another thing that you could do is sometimes you've made a treatment and you're just at the cusp of do I need to treat or not. This is another option to, to keep things at bay, right? So, I think what they can do too is I think Debbie has a, a, you know, a new colony of two packages getting started. You can take one of her friends and just put a bar right in force like that. Yeah. With foundations in it, your own foundation, you know, or without it, and they will build that right, themselves. There's, there's also people who take a medium frame, they put a medium frame and put it in their hive in position seven, and two things happen. They build drone inside the frame, and they hang drone off the bottom, and you don't have to buy a special frame. Does the medium have a fresh foundation in it, or are you putting it in empty? Usually put it in empty. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, one last thing about all this. And I'll get to your question in a second. Um, pest, disease. We didn't talk about some things, you know, I didn't go into pesticide world. And all the comb that you buy, all the foundation that you buy, it's a well known thing that it comes and it has cumafos and fluvolinate in it from the commercial providers. The, the wax is contaminated. And I, I know people who have comb and they take it out and go, look at this frame, isn't it a beaut? And the thing is black as coal. It's been in there for 15 years. It's got little tiny, and who knows what's festering inside that comb. As a public service announcement, you should be on a four-year rotation. Go in your hives and write foundation 13. And four years from now, you're going to look at that and say, that comb needs to come out. And every two years, take a number of your frames out and keep freshening that wax. Don't leave. There's no gold in something that's 15 years old and loaded with pesticide or whatever, who knows what they're bringing back. That sick system of having really old comb is probably why the queens don't last five years like they used to. It's just a personal IMO in my opinion. But um, you had a question. Yeah, you, you uh, skipped over it very lately about when you take your frames out for inspection and put it back in the same. Can you rotate it this way, or you got to put them back exactly one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in the same direction? Is that typical? I, I always start, well, first off, I don't know how everybody else's hives are situated, but I can walk around mine. I like that opportunity. I go to the mentoring hives, and they're stacked next to each other on this rail, and it kind of, I don't like that. But I always work from the same side of the hive. 
and I start in the top box, and they call T1, T2, T3, I record myself, as you probably know if you've ever watched my videos. And I pull them out, and I always put them back the right way. There's two schools of thought. It doesn't matter, or you're setting them back, because if you take a frame that they had in three set up the way they wanted it, and you switch it around, people report that they physically rebuild that frame to put it back the way it was when you moved it, right? But you go through techniques where, we just talked about last meeting, the swarm technique. You have six frames of brood stacked in there and there's no room for the queen to lay anymore. And you put an extra box on top and you pull every other frame up and replace it with fresh comb so that she has more room and you're relieving that swarm pressure. You're rearranging the box. <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. So sometimes hive manipulations, I don't know. But preferences, if there's no reason to switch the frame, why would you do it? That's my thought. I've seen beekeepers who don't keep the brood together. They reverse their supers and they have two frames of brood on the outside on one side and four frames of brood on the, on the outside on the other side and there's no man's land in between. And they damage the hive when you separate the brood like that, especially early in the season. Or when we've had 85 degree weather and now it's down to 38 as Right. You know, you want to keep the brood together is pretty much what I observe. Yeah, if you're doing that, that uh, pyramid up technique that I just talked about, you are going to keep the brood over top, right, of it. You're not going to take it and put it up here and separate the brood chamber, as Tim just alluded to. Any others? Okay. We're, we're over our time, so I'm just going to hit this. Let me see. That's a, that is the last one, though. Okay, one more. NJBA is having a meeting next weekend. Mm -hmm. I highly encourage all of you to go. There's so many good things that happen at these meetings, things you can network with other beekeepers. Go to the NJBA website, the link is right there. If you go to the store link, they've, they've made it so you can buy um, your admission through PayPal, which is really nice. So go check that out. This is what's going on. Tim, Tim went to Africa recently. He's going to be talking about that. The FDA is going to have a representative there. Grant Stiles, who's the biggest commercial beekeeper in New Jersey, is going to be speaking. He's not a person you want to miss. And they have all these workshops going on. So whatever it is for you, you will find it there. Please go support the NJPA. The sign-up for this ends the 26th, if I have that right. The 26th, after that, you'll pay 35 It's 25 to enter if you're a member. And, and I go to these meetings, every one of them, I'm at a loss as to why people don't attend because most of what I tell you or you hear or you see on our website comes out of these meetings. You could go get it yourself, right? A couple news and notes, last slide I have. We started something this year called the New Jersey Swarm Report. It came out of a curiosity of when does swarming start in your area. You know, I get questions all the time about this. If you go to our website, prominently on the front page, you'll see the swarm report. You can click on it. Once a week, or if not more, I go out and check what the surveys are. People have reported from all over the state. I'm expecting by next weekend we're going to break 100 reports. I've taken the data from that and plotted it in Google Maps. And you can see on a map of New Jersey where all the stuff is. And then there's charts from Hunterdon County you can see how many swarms versus Cumberland and so on. There's two metrics that we're gathering. How high was it? Standing height, need a ladder, higher. And the other one is how big is it? Is it small, basketball size, bigger than a basketball? It's interesting to look at the data and how it's panning out. I've, I've received some like, what do you think about this questions? One of them is, if I see the swarm, and it's in God's country up in the tree and I can't get to it, as Charlie told me this morning, should I report it? Yes. But what I want is I want you physically to see it before you put it in. Physically. I don't want you to hear, ah, oh, somebody told me there was a swarm. Because somebody else could have reported that physically seeing it. And you don't have to give up your data if you don't want to. If you want to just say it's in Flemington, New Jersey or Clinton, New Jersey, I'm fine with that. A lot of people have put addresses in. You can actually see the data 
Yeah. Are you are you charting any clusters of like when is the most swarm activity? Can you see that versus when the first swarm was, et cetera? If you go if you go there, it automatically aggregates at the bottom of that map. You could click on beginning of May versus the end of May. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Click literally click on the dates that it siphons it out. At the end of the year, I'm going to take that data and pivot it and be able to say when was it, I'll plot the busiest okay, seasons nice. and things like that. Yeah. I built the report so that we could twist and turn all the data to answer questions like that. We started something today where we have a lot of people who need mentors and we just don't physically have enough bodies to do it. So we've come up with this program where we're going to go out to you. If you're one of our beekeepers and you've answered our messages, I think we have a dozen people, we're going to go out and just watch you do an inspection and we'll guide you and be your eyes and ears. And we'll teach you what normal is. That's our objective today to carry on our team. There's a lot of bear damage going on, folks. Mm -hmm. I am playing roulette because there was a bear last year at my neighbor's property, literally across the street. And I still haven't put a bear fence up because I've been just so busy. There was one reported um, on Britain Road in Flemington. I don't know, Stan, if you've encountered any yet this year. I know Roger Garris has one at the I got a trap shed in my vineyard. Room. Yeah, so I mean, they're here, folks. Orange County, you are bear country, and that's all there is to it. There was two in Greensburg in the last couple weeks. Yeah. This is a time of year where they start migrating down, and the Division of Fish and Wildlife isn't going to do anything about them because they belong here. This is their habitat. If they start meandering into Trenton, they pick them up and take them back. <laughs> but, but they're not going to take them out of Hunterdon County. They're not. There's one in Rarefield. Yeah, and they're living here now, right? They've taken up residence because of the pressures, and they figured out how to get through 78 barrier and down here. They're in Bridgewater, too, by the way. Yeah. And uh, when I was out with the Fish and Game, so my traps, uh, one of the questions one of the beekeepers asked was, uh, how far did the bear go? I said, well, I know in Jersey, they go to Pennsylvania, which one across the river to go to New York. So she tells me, well, guess what? We got one tag now that's in Connecticut. So how do you get all the way up there with all the state highways? So there we yeah. go. Yeah, they, 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 they can get there. In, they there. Get there. <laughs> in February, she said they're in every county in New Jersey. Every county. They're there. Every county. Yeah. Are there any other preventative measures other than the um, electric fence? Because I've, I've talked to several people, and um, they're saying that the fencing isn't working. Now, I've talked to a Canadian um, beekeeper who is using, who's, who's been using and is having, having success with taking um, plywood and sticking three inch uh, nails up through the plywood and putting around the perimeter of your, of your yard. And, yeah. and, you know, the problem with that is that if you have small children or a pet, <laughs> you may that have does pose a problem. Uh, not, not to mention for the bear, right? I'm sure Division of Fish and Wildlife would not sanction that. Yeah. This, this is a thought, right? There are other methods. People have built, you know, put them in buildings. Um, there's a, a lighting system that comes on, so it's a light detector. And when the bear walks in the area, it shoots a flash in the strobe area. And the bear sees it, and it's almost like you know, seeing wolf eyeballs at night. It, it works during the day too, but not as effective, right? So that, that's a bear deterrent system. There's a number of things like that out there. Everybody talks about them, but the bear fence is the way to go. Most of the reason bear fences don't work is because one, you don't bait them. You need them to get a snout full of electricity or it's not gonna work. And people turn them off. I'm going on vacation, I'm gonna turn it off. Duh. Don't do that, right? As soon as the bear tests it and it's done, you're done. I don't care if you turn it on, they'll go through it, right? If you listen to the presentation she gave, you got to bait it at the right time so that the bear comes up. The bears in New Jersey, as it's been said, smarter than the average bear, they see a bear fence and they, they don't test it because they know what it is in New Jersey. They've had enough exposure to them here, right? But I don't... The nail thing kind of gets me squeamish because I'm sure somebody from Fish and Game would yell at that. You want to add a comment? Yeah, let me add a couple of things. Number one, I saw a person in Sussex County who used an old horse trailer, like a, uh, a livestock trailer. Um, 
I had a guy in Bedminster who put a motion sensor on his apiary and wired it into New Jersey 101.5. So when the light came on and there were human voices in Bedminster, it discouraged the bear and he doesn't have a bear fence up. Um, I'm a strong proponent of bear fence. It's got to be baited though, just like Kevin said, and the bait's got to be fresh. We had a guy in Vernon who got his whole apiary destroyed last year. He had his electric fence, but he, he, he prided himself on not having to bait it regularly. And actually the day he was cleaning it up, he took pictures because the bear came back out of the bushes in the broad daylight looking for a second helping. So now he keeps it baited very, very regularly. So what are they yeah. going to get zapped on the mouth? Yeah, they got to get zapped in the face. Uh, you know, the, the, what they say about these bear fences is once the bear's going in, they don't have a reverse. They will not back up. Put it all the way around. And if they don't get their face in it and they go in sideways or, you know, you leave the wrong gap and things like that, and they could get in, once they get head in, they have no reverse. So part of why bear fences are ineffective is people don't build them correctly, too. Now, we're using a cylinder welded fence around the eye hanging on two T posts and uh, that has been 100 percent we have a bear all the time. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, that, that, that works Can you take a picture well. of that and send that over? With motion sensor and the radio comes on, that's available in a nice little package. Yeah. That, that works. I think that would work well too, but I've never been trying to bear. Uh, we just recently had our water bucket crushed by the bear. So we know the bear is there all the time. We have we have bear. We've never Bit of a nuisance because you have to take that fence off. It's time you're going to work with high. Yeah. But uh, you know how to put it back. Yeah. Um, we're, I'm sorry, I knew this meeting was a stretch at an hour. We're a half hour over. So I want to be mindful of time. I have two more points. I think there was one more question here. Uh, yeah. uh, if, you, if you happen to see a bear in your yard, can you call uh, Mr. Rotlet and have him come out? Is there. Yeah. I, their recommendation is don't call unless they're, they have nuisance ratings for the bears. If they're a nuisance to the point where they're a threat or they've done damage or whatever, don't come out. But if they're just walking through, say hi and go back in your house, that's their recommendation. Would you kind of call if they're attacking your house? Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they will say, not that they're not sympathetic about hives, they are. If you talk to them, it's their utmost priority to keep the hives functional. But if you don't have a bear fence, they're just going to tell you you need to put one up. They, they, they can't give you any other guidance on that. Uh, the last thing I want to leave you with is, what is the traditional thing that happens this weekend? People open their pools. If you haven't put a water source out for your bees, this is the perfect weekend to do it before they discover your neighbor's pool. Just take a bucket, fill it with water, Put some uh, styrofoam peanuts in the top. Drill some holes in the side of the bucket so that if it rains so much that the peanuts would overflow, they won't. And set it somewhere in your apiary. Uh, two videos available on our site to show the one that we have at our mentoring hives and um, Stan's watering hole is up there too. You can take a look at what he built. Um, be kind to your neighbors and give a source to your bees. It's good for you too because if you have water near your hives, they don't have to fly to Saskatchewan to get water. That's a waste of resource. Might as well give it to them. There's different schools of thought. Bob takes care of our hives at the mentoring. The, the hives are here and the bucket is here and they use it. There are people who say it has to be X number of feet for people, for the scouts to be able to communicate inside the hive when they do the wagon dance that water is so far away. But for whatever reason, he's dispelled that myth. So put your water out this weekend if you haven't found a water source for your bees. Very important for them to have water, especially when we get to June, July, and things start drying up. Uh, open the floor. Any questions, comments, thoughts for today? Anybody need to share anything? Go to the order. If not, thank you very much. Please make sure you signed in. Kevin. And, um, and take home yes, please. You didn't eat. Take home what you brought. If you didn't get something to eat, please take a little nosh for your ride home. And uh, thank you for coming out. We really thank appreciate you. it.